Can you even call yourself a finance YouTuber if you haven't made a video on this topic? No. Well, in that case, here's my take on a classic. Financial independence retire early, but most people call it... Look at those who are saving early and living frugally in order to retire young. We are spending money we don't have to buy things we don't need. Accidentally started a cult. I just quit my job. That was probably a bit dramatic, I'm sorry, but every so often you kind of just got to let me get carried away with the intros. It's an itch I need to scratch. The less said about it, the better. Right, on to the content. Quick history lesson. Let's face it, the desire to quit your job is probably as old as jobs themselves, but the FIRE movement, as it likes to call itself, can trace its origins back to a book written in 1992 called Your Money or Your Life, written by these people here. The book didn't really catch until the year 2000, when the adoption of the internet fanned the embers of FIRE first discussed in this book but it would take blogs like Early Retirement Extreme and The Financial Samurai to really ignite the concept. And then it was Mr. Money Mustache who provided a catalyst for combustion, turning this campfire of an idea into a roaring wildfire of a movement. Okay, there was a lot of fire puns in that paragraph right there, but I stayed up all ignite writing them, so I was delighted with myself. And you know, if you don't like puns, that's fine, but I guess we just ain't kindling spirits. Okay, I will stop now. I'll tell you what, whoever can write the best fire pun in the comments below, I'll give you 10 quid. The way we're going to decide who writes the best, do it with your thumbs ups. So vote and in 48 hours, whoever's got the most likes on their comment wins 10 quid from me. The core teachings and principles of fire. I'm not going to dwell on this too much because basically there's millions of videos that explain what fire is, but essentially fire looks to challenge the traditional wisdom that individuals should work their whole life in order to only become financially free at a traditional retirement age of 67. Instead, FIRE and its followers believe financial independence can be achieved at a much younger age. I retired back in 2017 and it was six months before my 40th birthday. Really, it's the first part, the FI or the financial independence part that I think is important here. I mean, one criticism I see thrown at the FIRE community quite a lot is if you retire when you're in your 40s or 30s or even 20s, you're just going to get bored. I think what the FIRE community would say back to that is now, I can't speak for them because I'm not a member of that community, but basically it's the financial independence that they're seeking and retiring early is just a choice that you can do with your financial independence if you want to. They aren't retiring early, they are in fact time rich. Now FIRE itself is based around a few core philosophies and key principles that it's important to define at this stage so we can examine the benefits and negatives of the movement later on in the video. First of all, achieving FIRE relies on some pretty simple math. So you need to work out exactly what you want to live off each year and then you times that number by between 25 and 33 typically. That gives you your FIRE number. This is the total amount of money that you will need invested before you hit FIRE or basically before the FIRE community think that you can retire. Now the difference in the range of numbers between 25 and 33 depends on you know, your risk appetite and how comfortable you want to be in early retirement. With the more you've got saved, the more likely you are to survive the period of FIRE. You will then get to draw down 4% of this value each year to live off. This logic comes from something called the Trinity Study. I've linked it below in the description for you and we'll discuss it in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. The FIRE community say though that the idea is if the stock market has achieved a rate of return of around 9% on average long term, so if you have your FIRE fund sat in a low cost index fund like the S&P 500, the logic here is that if you draw 4% of that a year, then theoretically that money can last you forever. Now getting to your FIRE number all comes down to how quickly you can save. On screen now is a diagram that shows at different saving rates how quickly you would get to a point where you have 25 times what you spend. For this reason, FIRE is often associated with extreme frugality. This is my reusable boiling water. Yes, I know it may be a little chunky, but it saves me from spending more money on my water bill by cutting on the water and putting more water in the pot, dumping it, and then doing it all over again. So that saves my water. Because the aim of the game is to retire as quickly as possible. So the more you save, the quicker you can do that. Dave Ramsey, <gasps> yep, that guy, has this concept that he applies to paying off your debt called gazelle intensity. Basically, you need to run away from your debt like a gazelle that's been hunted. Because you are dialed in, baby. Who's he calling baby? Dave has a gazelle mentality towards debt, then the fire community pursues frugality with a cheetah-like pace. Really, the benefits of this movement are clear and simple. It promotes a simple way of living and frugality. Then I cover it up with bubble wrap, and then this is a tablecloth, and it makes a perfect bet. It challenges the traditional thinking around working, and it encourages low-cost investing and saving. 
I also really like how a lot of the content that comes out of the FIRE community champions an estimated growth rate of about 4 to 5% on your investments. If you compare this to, say, Dave's 11%. Uh -huh. So why is there so much negativity towards FIRE online? When on paper, it kind of seems like a harmless movement that encourages people to make sensible financial decisions. Well, from my research, it feels like you could split the criticisms into two main camp fires. The criticism against the numbers and then the criticism against the movement itself. Let's start with the math. One of the key foundations of the FIRE movement is this idea that you can build up a pot of cash and then you can draw 4% a year from it and it will theoretically last you forever. FIRE practitioners often quote the Trinity study as their source of information for this. The issue with that is, they're wrong. William P. Bengham first described the 4% rule in the 1994 issue of the Journal of Financial Planning. And then the theory was cemented into finance folklore by the Trinity study in 1998. Bengham's rule, as it's also known, basically states that if you have a pot of cash and you draw 4% from it, that it will likely last you at least 30 years. He came to this conclusion by looking at what was the worst point you could ever possibly retire in the past and worked out that a 4% withdrawal would have seen you through this period. Now, the problem is that Bengham's work has been twisted and misquoted so many times that its use as a hard and fast rule is problematic. On the positive side, Bengen did come out and say that the fact he based this on the worst ever period in the markets means that actual average safe withdrawal rate is likely 7% a year. Issue is, if you take 7% and you find yourself in the worst period, you're screwed. But the real problem is that this notion that the 4% withdrawal rate will allow your funds to last forever, and this is where the real concern comes in in the context of the FIRE movement. Benga's work was based on allowing the fund to last for 30 years, basically as long as people are retired. Fire looks to get you out of work a lot earlier, in your 50s, 40s, 30s, maybe even your 20s. So the pot of cash needs to last a lot longer. Bengen's study looked to make it so you died before the pot did. The pot didn't last forever, the pot would effectively be gone if you lived for longer than those 30 years. Feel that you want to leave money to your heirs after you pass away, uh, you have to specify that, and that, of course, would reduce your withdrawal rate. But certain areas of the FIRE community that I've seen quote this 4% rule as a magic number that means your pot of funds will last forever. There is absolutely no evidence of that within Bengen's work or within the Trinity study. There are other studies that look to expand beyond the 30 years and kind of model that out, but it still stands that you can't use the 4% rule as this hard and fast rule that your funds will last forever. Now, you could semi-retire and work to earn money throughout your semi-retirement. But the idea that you can just save up 25 times your earnings and then live off that forever with the 4% rule is an untested theory. And all of the evidence only ever looked at a 15 to 30 year period, which was a typical retirement. For me personally, I'll likely approach withdrawals year by year, looking at the previous year's performance of my assets and then making a decision on how much I take out the next year as a result. If the markets grew 10% last year, great, I'll spend 7% the next year. If the markets tanked 20%, then I'll cope with that by having a year's worth of cash on hand in savings. So if the markets ever do take a massive dip, I can lean on that for that year so I'm not kicking my portfolio when it's down. A hard and fast withdrawal rate that assumes everyone can just take 4% of whatever they've got for the rest of their lives just lacks a bit of flex in my eyes. The next set of criticisms focuses on the movement itself. First of all, let's address the elephant in the room by saying that the FIRE movement and those who talk about it are in big business. The likes of Mr Money Mustache and Early Retirement Extreme operate blogs that pull in millions of views a month. While they might have got to the position they're at by being frugal, I can guarantee that they're making millions now from talking about FIRE itself. I run a small YouTube channel, 40,000 subscribers at the time of this recording, and I'm making four figures a month. So how much is a blog with millions of viewers a month going to be making? You could argue that FIRE is nothing but very basic investing principles repackaged into an attractive brand. This brand has then been reimagined multiple times. Post FIRE. Lean FIRE. Fat FIRE. Oh Lord Jesus, it's a FIRE. In order to generate more views, more sales, more clicks, more revenue, more moustaches. One example that I found funny of this was the writer of Early Retirement Extreme preached a very extreme frugal lifestyle, as his blog would suggest. I think he lived in a van in the woods or something. And then he announced one day that he was kind of stopping blogging because he's accepted a job at a hedge fund. And there's nothing wrong with fire as a concept, but I do have an issue with those looking to profit directly out of it. Buy this book so I can show you how to save money is a little bit backwards. I'll tell you how to save some money. Don't buy the book. 
Now, I am being a little bit harsh because a lot of these blogs, including Mr. Money Mustache and all of that, are free to engage with. And I would be some kind of hypocrite if I sat here saying people giving out free content shouldn't make money because that's exactly what I do. But I do have an issue with people reinventing this concept of fire constantly, trying to sell courses and books and whatever in order to make a profit out of it. The other criticism I see is the fact that the FIRE movement promotes extreme frugality at the expense of people's happiness. By supplementing the meat with the beef fat, Stephanie saved 75% on the ingredients for her lasagna. That you should live your life and not cut back as much in order to kind of sacrifice consumption today for the hope of greater consumption tomorrow. I would counter this by saying, I think to a lot of people, being frugal is fun and they might enjoy and get a kick out of cutting back and, you know, trying to save here and there. If that's your thing, that's fine. One thing I would say here is though, if you're saying I want 25 times what I'm living off right now, and right now I'm reusing tea bags for months to save pennies, then consider that you're signing up to live as you do now for the rest of your life. Again, you can work once you've achieved financial independence to have those luxuries in life, but just don't condemn yourself to a life of misery by cutting right down and having a savings goal that's 25 times you at bare bones. But one thing I do think is a genuine criticism of the movement is something I am very much guilty of in the past. That is the focus on reducing cost over improving income. I used to be the kind of guy that walked three miles just to save the cost of a tram. Shout out to all my Manchester people living that tram life. I would live off very little each month and be really proud of it, but I wasn't valuing my time enough. Being frugal is a full-time job. I know it is because I've done it. You know, meal prepping and planning things and walking instead of catching the bus, all of that takes time. When you could be focusing on improving your income instead. I'll give you an example. If you earn £1,500 per month after tax and your basic living costs are £1,000 of that, including all your food and bills, meaning you save £500, let's say you can cut your living costs by 20% by being frugal, meaning you save another 200 quid. That's great, but why not instead get a job at a Chinese takeaway, delivering takeaways two nights a week, three hours each shift, 40 quid a shift, that's £320 a month you've just earned extra from six hours a week of your time. I did this for years. You can be focused on cutting back, that's fine. With the dishwasher reaching a temperature of 170 degrees, the lasagna will be fully cooked in one and a half hours without using the additional gas of an oven. But make sure you're giving a lot of thought to improving your income instead. You can only ever cut back exactly what you earn, but the upside on earnings is limitless if you find the right thing. Take this YouTube channel. It's now at the point where it's worth it for me to hire a cleaner instead of me doing it because I want to make more videos. That's something I never would have considered in the past. You changed, bro. My thoughts on fire are like this. I think it's just a rebrand of some basic investing lessons wrapped in a sexy slogan which appeals to the frustrations of modern life and working being a bit grim. I don't agree with people wrapping up these simple investing principles into paid for products that they then charge people to access. But I do really like all of these blogs that have created a community and are encouraging people to save and invest. I don't practice fire, but I don't hate it or think it's flawed. I actually think to many, it's like a light bulb has gone off when they discover it. And you finally see a route to achieving something you want with your finances. That's excellent because in my opinion, everyone should be investing. And whether it's a Canadian with a dodgy mustache that gets you going, or it's a brummie in a loft in Manchester with a dodgy everything, then it's fine. Whatever convinces you to start, whatever gets you some skin in the game, whatever starts you off on your investing journey is right by me. It's good, right? Yeah.